bones had been outward, like he exploded from inside. In 1979's Alien, a team from the Nostromo, while investigating the alien beacon emanating from the derelict ship on LV-426, would encounter the space jockey, the alien also known as the pilot, or later, a member of the Malakak. It was a bizarre creation of famed artist H.R. Giger that was seemingly grafted to or perhaps even growing out of its chair. Surprisingly, they were left unexplained on film for 33 years until the release of Prometheus. But long before that, 10 years after Alien in 1989, a major part of the Alien Expanded Universe began with Dark Horse's release of the initial run of the Aliens comic books. In Part 1, now called Outbreak, we're introduced to a new living space jockey with amazing technology and a hatred for the xenomorph and mankind alike. At the end of Outbreak, Hicks and Newt are with a team of marines on the homeworld of the Xenomorph, but they're unable to leave as they're trapped on their landing craft surrounded by attacking aliens. When suddenly, in a blinding flash of light, the aliens are all killed off. The two of them exit the ship, only to find a suited space jockey floating motionless several feet off the ground. Newt felt that it had dead eyes, both seen and not seen. It had destroyed the aliens, but not for their sake. It didn't speak, but something exploded inside her head, bright like a million suns. The images boiled up from a deeper place. The same plane as primal instinct, hunger, pain, fear, and hatred. Forced back into her memories, she saw herself with her family in the crawler on LV-426, and they were approaching the derelict ship. Her parents went inside and she watched them on a monitor feed, where they encountered the dead space jockey. The living one knew that she had seen this wreckage, and shared with her a grotesque form of empathy. She could see a juggernaut ship and there was a jockey on board, along with xenomorph eggs. One got loose and infected him, causing him to crash his ship on a nearby moon. The moon was LV-426, and this new pilot was a friend of the one who perished on Acheron, where his deadly cargo would be waiting for Newt's parents and the Nostromo crew to later find. The living pilot had come to the alien homeworld out of hate, and it had rescued them in the name of revenge. Now safe from the advancing xenomorphs, the two would leave the alien world and return to Earth or what's left of it from the alien invasion. The situation is grim, and now the higher-ups are leaving the planet. So the two decide to leave as well, and as they make their exit, Newt is once again connected telepathically to the jockey. He appears to her once more, but he's changed since the homeworld. It followed them back to Earth, and it's aware of Dr. Arona's plan, a plan to use nuclear weapons to try to kill off the Xenomorphs. Initially, she thought that the alien had shared their thirst for vengeance with the Xenos. They led it home in the belief that it may want to help them, but they were wrong. It shared many of their human emotions, hate, anger, and the desire to conquer. It no longer cared about the aliens, its interest had shifted. The soldiers assumed that they would return one day and terraform Earth for themselves, but the pilot would watch and would be waiting for them, and it told Newt just to let her know, as if bragging out of spite. In the novelized version of the comic Earth Hive by Steve Perry, the jockey, also called a collector from their egg collecting habit, is gloating and filled with a snide sense of joy. It lusted and felt superior. It hated, it raged, and felt many other feelings humans just can't understand, adding that it might return with other Malakak to take Earth from the winners. There is a brief mention of the space jockey in part 3 of the alien invasion story Female War, but we don't catch up with it again until the short story follow-up, The Alien. Here the pilot is still in orbit around Earth and is now terraforming the planet. The temperate zones have cooled an average of nearly 40 degrees, and the president himself is leading a team to meet with the alien on its request. He consults his advisors about Arona's bombs, thinking that they should have made the Earth uninhabitable for years to come, and he's told he would be right if the bombs had indeed all gone off. Unfortunately, Dr. Arona made no secret of his intentions, broadcasting his message around the Earth and deep into space. They believed that the pilot of the terraforming vessel saw this message and then circumvented Arona's detonator and removed the warheads of the fusion bombs in the stockpile. Whether the pilot was gathering materials for the plasma generator, 
or was just ensuring that another lunatic wouldn't threaten its new home, they don't know. They also feel that it had no idea how to destroy the aliens without destroying this new home, but Ripley took care of much of that issue when she lured most of the aliens to the Queen Mother where they would be destroyed by the older nukes of Verona's that were left untouched. But not all of the aliens were killed. After giving a valiant speech, the President and his team board the Juggernaut ship. The alien giant towers over them with the Earth Hive novel stating that it stood 7 to 8 meters or 23 to 26 feet tall. Surely this is a brilliant creature capable of single-handedly altering the climates of the entire Earth, yet its eyes convey no intellect at all, void of expression and feeling, cold and empty like the eyes of a dead animal. Suddenly the President feels pain in his forehead, and the pilot is in his mind. He wants us to go this way, we must all disrobe completely as they are exposed to a massively bright light that burns off the top layer of their skin. The others worry that the president's mind might be under control, but they have no other options. Now on the bridge, the alien is seen with screens all around him, showing the xenomorphs on Earth. One of the crew notes that this is the bridge, but there are no manual controls. Perhaps the ship's functions respond to the pilot's voice. The president then says that he hopes that we can settle this quickly and peacefully, and introduces his secretary of state who timidly reaches out to shake the jockey's hand. The pilot takes his hand and pauses for a moment before violently jerking him, breaking and snapping his arm while twisting the poor guy in the air. Chaos ensues as the alien, now in a fighting stance, attacks the team. In the carnage, we see that everyone outside of the president is an android. Even so, the Malakak makes short work of the team, while one of them, still barely functioning, tells the president he must move quickly. Now with the alien giant looming over the president, he pulls out a fake tooth, one with a chamber for concealment, and takes a few drops of liquid onto his tongue. Seconds later, a chestburster erupts and the jockey is in sheer terror as the alien latches onto him. Just then, a disfigured but still functioning android reaches into his own stomach and pulls out a device to communicate with. Enemy vessel operations have been interrupted. I repeat, operations have been interrupted. Our scheduled offensive should be launched immediately. Blasting off from the surface below comes a volley of nuclear missiles, and they smash into the alien ship, destroying it in a brilliant flash of light. So the outbreak pilot was a friend of the one found dead on LV-426. Unfortunately, outside of this series, in another comic, Aliens Apocalypse, The Destroying Angels, there is little to be known of the pre-engineer Malakak. Ridley Scott would use the prequels to explain that the two aliens are the same thing, but with his series left unfinished, there is no evidence that the corpse seen on the derelict on LV-426 is in fact an engineer in a suit, a possibility even brought up in the alien role-playing game. However, like the engineers, both races have a full range of human emotions and beyond. In particular, we see them displaying what we know of as negative emotions, hate, anger, greed, and the lust for power. Both of them fear the alien, though the engineers may also revere and respect them from a safe distance. And they may both harbor hatred for artificial life as they attack them on sight. The two, if separate, both seek the end of humanity and afterwards either of them may terraform Earth to use how they see fit. But where the engineers wore suits to take on the look of the Malakak, these aliens had that look naturally, and instead wore human-like spacesuits, likely to survive in inhospitable environments. As seen on the alien homeworld, the suit appeared to be fully contained, had tones of green for its color, with a yellow transparent helmet. Its boots seemed to suggest that it had hooved feet, and there is room for a tail on its back. Most notably though, he's got a handheld device with two screens or panels in his right hand, and a larger device in the left hand that is connected to his hip. This appears to be the weapon that he used to kill the aliens. Both hands could be holding two parts of a weapon, or two separate devices. This portrayal of the space jockey doesn't line up with H.R. Giger's and Dan O'Bannon's original ideas of the alien as a peaceful race who didn't realize the eggs were dangerous and loaded them into their cargo. But it does fit in with the Lovecraftian themes behind the alien and the pilot where they are separate and ancient creatures with no ties to humanity that existed long before the prequels. To learn more about the space jockey giants of Aliens Apocalypse or the original space jockey concept of Dan O'Bannon and Ron Cobb, check out one of these videos. Otherwise, 
Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time.